Hi there, my name is Aaron Short and welcome to my YouTube channel. We've got another interview today and so far from Martin we've had Dick Boak, Corey Congelio and Craig Thatcher. So I'm very excited today to have the one and only CF Martin IV. Hi Chris, how are you doing? I'm good. Stuck here at home but I'm good. It's so, we're so grateful for your time and for joining us on here. It really means a lot to me because I'm a huge fan of Martin Guitar. So thank you so oh, much great. for doing this. Really appreciate it. Good. So we have people here live in the chat. We already have 20 people here. Um, please ask your questions later on. I'll address them if we have time. And please follow along and I'll say hi as we go. I want to get straight into this because we have one hour. And I love, with these interviews, I love the stories. And of course, one thing I love about Martin Guitar is the history. So for anyone that doesn't know it, could you please start with a brief, um, a brief history of the company, if that's possible? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always a challenge to try and encapsulate 187 years of history into, you know, a couple of paragraphs. And we actually have to, of course, go all the way back to CF growing up in Marknerkirchen, apprenticing with his father as a cabinet maker, but showing an interest in the guitar. And then the story I tell is, of course, the guitar you know, over time came up out of, out of Mesopotamia. And by the late 17, early 1800s, it had become the guitar. The thing that, you know, we kind of recognize, six strings. And for whatever reason, he was really intrigued by making guitars. His father encouraged him. The violin makers, who were, had a pretty good business in Mark Kirchen, were they were weary of the guitar. They didn't see it as the, the same kind of orchestral instrument that the violin, for example, is. So his father ended up getting CF a job at the Stauffer workshop in Vienna, where he worked for many years, split off briefly in Vienna with an older gentleman. That partnership didn't last very long, but he married that gentleman's daughter and they had a son. He moved back to Mark Kirchen, thinking he would go home and start making guitars in his hometown. When he came home, he found out that the violin makers had had second thoughts and decided to get into the guitar business. And I think they weren't happy that CF was going to be competition. And we believe that they used the rule, which is still the law today in Germany, you must apprentice in a particular trade or craft. And so what they said is, you are apprenticed as a cabinet maker in Germany, so have at it. But cabinets and guitars are different. So if you want to make guitars, you have to start in the beginning. I'm sure that was very frustrating for him, having spent all this time in Vienna, studying under Stauffer. And so I think it was that, and, and I'm doing some research now. I want to, when the factory reopens, I want to get back in the museum and do a, a lot, not a live, but I want to do a video tour and I want to spend more time at each of the displays. And apparently in the 1830s in Europe, there was a lot of friction and it was around Europe moving away from that period when the, that everyone, that countries were run by monarchs. And so I believe this friction also gave him the impetus to get, say, hey, I don't know where this thing's going to go. Why don't I go to the new world and give it a shot? And so that's what happened in 1833. He got up to Bremen with his wife, his daughter, son, his worldly possessions, probably some guitars, sailed across the Atlantic, rented a shop in lower Manhattan, 196 Hudson Street, started to sell guitars, started to make guitars. So now again, doing a little research on new, in, about New York. New York at that time was pretty rough and tumble. They had come from smaller towns, more established towns in Europe. And Mrs. Martin had some friends who were living in this part of Pennsylvania. She would come out and visit. And I'm assuming at some point she grabbed Mr. Martin by the ear and said, we're moving to Pennsylvania. <laughs> and what did they find when they got out here? They found a transplanted Pennsylvania German community. People talk about the Pennsylvania Dutch it has nothing to do with Holland. It's Pennsylvania Deutsch. So when they came out here, they found, hey, people cook German food the way we used to cook it. They still speak a German dialect that we're somewhat familiar with. I got a chance to go in and see Mark McCurchin after the wall came down. I was surprised how the topography looked so much like this part of eastern Pennsylvania. So that's why we're here. And you had the old factory and then you had the new factory, right? Yet the old factory was a conglomeration of additions put on from 1858, 1859. We started at Cherry Hill because my, my ancestors were not Moravian. They couldn't live in Nazareth. But I think it was in 1858, the town incorporated itself. So we moved downtown, bought 
a piece of property and there's a family ancestral homestead. And then this, like I said, conglomeration of additions that served us well until the folk boom, at which point my father convinced my grandfather that the factory had just become antiquated. It was, a you know, buildings stuck on buildings and floors and no elevators. And, you know, you got a lot of exercise. My grandfather said that was his workout was, you know, walking the floors every day. And so thanks to the folk boom by 1963, my dad came home from a trade show in Chicago and said to his father, he said, you know, we really need to consider this new factory. And, and my grandfather said, why? He said, well, based on the, the results from the trade show and our capacity at North Street, we are sold out for the next four years. So that gave them the confidence to go to the bank, to borrow the money, to buy the land, to build the new factory. And what happens? They just about get it up and running and folk music and rock and roll collide. And off to the races again we go. And now a whole nother generation of people, musicians, either professional or amateur, want to play the guitar, both the acoustic and the electric. And so my dad, he had a great run. He caught the business at the beginning of the folk boom with his grandfather, wrote it all the way up till the end of the folk rock boom, which was, came in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Hmm. Actually, you say that some, someone in one of these interviews mentioned that Marden once made an electric guitar. Yeah, you know, all of us in the guitar business are always looking for opportunity. And, and, and a lot of times it's like, well, I could do that. And so the first step was to put the arm and pickups on basically flat top Martin guitars, which was they're really quirky looking. But I think it was a bad idea. They didn't sell very well. The next step was it was a step in the right direction. But. You know, sometimes you're, you're best known for what you're known for. We were never known for acoustic, for electric guitars. You know, that was Fender, that was Gibson, but we gave it a shot and we came out with the, the, the GT series. And they had a little bit of an ES-335 look to them. But as a friend of mine said, he said, the problem with the GT series is that the company mounted the pickups on the top. And it was a car top with F-holes. And unlike the F, the the Gibson ES-335, where the pickups were then bolted onto a block of wood. And the Martin guitars, when you turn them up, the top would vibrate and they would feedback. And unfortunately, not in a nice way. It was, it was like uncontrollable feedback. You know, it wasn't that kind of feedback. You're like, okay, I'm going to have fun. It's like, whoa, what is this thing doing? So then that failed. And then, you know, now, now it's my turn to run the company, right? So what should we do? We should make electric guitars again. And once again, we learned maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> but one thing I do have to say, and, and I had an article and I darn it, I don't know where it went. And if anybody ever comes across it, please get me a copy. But the article basically said Martin was the first company to put piezo pickups on acoustic guitars right. before anybody. And in fact, I remember the product. It was called the FRAP, the mm -hmm. Flat Response Audio Pickup. And it had a little piezo element that you would find the magic spot, right? Yeah. Stick underneath the guitar. Yeah. And then it had a preamp that was outboard that was the size of like a fuzz buster. If anybody remembers having a fuzz buster when they were trying to not get pulled over in your car. Mm -hmm. And the stinking thing, it was so complex. It was really highly engineered at a time when nobody really knew how to do this. The electronics cost almost as much as the guitar. And yeah. that, that was the problem. They just, people were like, you're kidding me. I got to spend, a, I just paid 400 bucks for the D18. I got to spend another 350 for the pickup. Mm. But we were the first. I was actually talking about solid body electric guitars. That was my yeah, we did question. that too. But yeah. I'm not doing that again. No? So then no, we're not going to see a solid, solid body Martin guitar anytime in the future. You know, I've really learned people want companies like Martin to stick to what they want them, what they know them, what they know they do. Mm. And what we do is acoustic guitars. We're very focused on figuring out a way to amplify acoustic guitars with partners like Larry Fishman. Mm. But I don't think I'm getting back in the electric guitar business again. Mm. Now, I'm glad you brought that up because on, the, on my YouTube channel, I review and cover a lot of acoustic guitar pickups. So can we go into that? Because not, not a lot of people talk about this, but what's your memory of amplifying acoustic guitars over the years? Like, do you have any yeah. stories about that? So what, what I finally concluded, you know, after, because I was a road warrior and I would travel a lot when I was younger and I'd get into, you know, four or five music stores a week and do a clinic. And, and some stores, they were ready for us. 
a lot of times we had to make sure we brought our own equipment. And we got into a store in Ohio. I think I bought it about an Akron. And this guy did a huge business in big PA. So we go into his PA room and he says, do you mind if we do the clinic in here? I said, no, I think this would be pretty cool. So what I realized, and I tell people this story, I say, every element in that attempt to amplify your acoustic guitar is the make or break element. So if you have a really good acoustic guitar and a really good pickup and a really good preamp and a really good PA system, it's probably going to sound really good. But if any one of those elements is less than good, that's what's going to drag you down. Mm. And I just, I feel very strongly about that, that each one of those elements should be as good as you can afford. Because if you, if you buy one cheap one, that's the thing that's going to make it sound bad. Mm. So you, you kind of have to look at this holistically and say, okay, every part of this equation has to be as good as I can afford if I'm looking for good sound. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I just find it fascinating because Martin is known for history so, so much, but you've, you've done some really interesting things with electronics, like the Aura system, the yep. F1 system with Fishman. Yep. Yep. I mean, can yep. you talk, you, you seem to be quite, quite, quite forward thinking with the amplification. So are you, still, are you still looking at ways now to improve that? Also, can you tell us about your relationship with Larry? Because I've spoken to Larry many times at NAMM. Yep. Yep. He's, he's a great guy. And I'd love to hear about how you, how you guys met in the first place. So I think, let me go back. So we moved away from the FRAP, and then we got involved with Barkus Berry. And uh, Mr. Barkus and Mr. Berry, brilliant electronical engineers, you know, already had built a brand, very familiar with PZO pickups. The problem was that they couldn't make them thin. And so it was this big, fat thing with a big, wide saddle, and it was kind of, it was okay. And then bless Mr. Barkus and Mr. Barry were sort of, they were getting older and they're like, you know, this really isn't the core of our business and we're not going to invest any more in it. And in fact, we're probably going to get out of this making acoustic guitar pickups business. And we're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? I think it was John Marshall, one of my colleagues who retired, who said, there's a guy in Boston that I know of who's an electrical engineer who makes pickups for basses. Let me give him a call. So Larry came down and, and we're talking like, Larry, what's, what's the deal? He goes, you know, I'm, I'm by training, I'm an electrical engineer, but my passion is music and I play out. And I got so frustrated with the pick pickups available for upright basses, I decided to design my own. And so that's, I think, how he started his reputation because then he would go out and guys would go, Larry, what are you playing there? And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, it sounds really good. He goes, oh, I made it myself. Oh, can I get one? It's like, oh, so that was now he's making them in his basement for guys that play upright basses. We have a conversation in Nazareth and, he, and we're like, Larry, we need a replacement for Barkus Berry and we'd really like to get it thin. And he goes, OK, and you should get him to tell this story, because apparently he left Nazareth. And we said he said, like, well, how many? And we said, you know, thousands. And he goes, OK, and he'll tell the story about driving back to Massachusetts going how on, how on earth am I going to do this? I've been making these bass pickups in my basement one, one at a time by, by hand. <laughs> but he's an entrepreneur, and that's what jump-started it. And when Larry and I talk about, you know, the goal, I think, for amplifying an acoustic guitar, you want it to be transparent. Mm. I don't think you want to know it's being amplified. You want to kind of just go, wow, that sounds really good and loud. Mm. And so that's where a lot of these incremental improvements have come is let's make this thing better and make it more invisible. So whose idea was the, was the Aura F1 in like the, um, the retro series? Cause that was a really interesting system. Was so that it, you know, or, you, or, or, or you guys? It, it, you know, the thing we found with Larry and his colleagues is when we have conversations together, that's where we, we move things. Because Larry can do other stuff. You know, he's in electric pickups and he's in amplifiers. So when we talk, it's like, okay, Larry, this is what we need. And he knows we're a good customer. We do some volume. We pay our bills. You know, we, we help support him. And he might even say without Martin, he might not be in this industry to the way he is today. What, where I got involved was when my colleagues were saying, oh, you know, now we're using these different microphones. And I'm like, okay, what if 
we took vintage microphones and took vintage guitars from our museum. And initially, my colleagues are like, what are you talking about? Why would we want to do that? I'm like, well, why wouldn't we want to do that? And then we did it, and everybody's like, oh, that's cool. That's pretty cool that we can record an old Martin guitar on an old microphone and then input that sound into a new Martin guitar that looks like an old Martin guitar. Yeah, I thought that system was way ahead of its time. And I've actually, behind me, I've got the Modern Deluxe with the Aura Plus, the brand new yeah. system, which I've been reviewing on my channel. That sounds great. And it's interesting the way we've gone away from the controls on the side and it looks yeah. more sleek. So again, I, have, I need to ask you, is, is that something that Martin, did you get that from customers that request or was it something you guys wanted or something that Fishman suggested? What the customers were saying, particularly for like a Martin, they say, you know, it's one thing if I've, I've got my beginner guitar, maybe even my intermediate guitar and somebody cut a big hole in the side and someday that system becomes obsolete. They said, when you take a Martin guitar, particularly a high-end Martin guitar, and you cut a big hole in the side, mm. and you put this electronics package in there that two years from now is going to become obsolete, it kind of makes the guitar obsolete. Mm. So it did come from the customers who are like, isn't there? And then, then remember, we all went to the little round knobs, so it got more discreet. And now what we do is we go in the sound hall. Yeah. Ultimately, I think it's going to be on your phone. Ah, I'm glad you said I, that. <laughs> You know, when, when and you talk to Larry about wireless and he goes, Chris, it's complicated because of the bandwidths and all. Mm -hmm. But I think that would be the ideal thing is you, th there's no controls on the guitar. Mm -hmm. Your phone is talking to something in the guitar that says change the bass, change the volume, yeah. switch, switch the you know, whatever, turn the volume up. So that's next. That's going to come. Because the great thing with that system was the flexibility and advanced controls that it had. But I think it'd be great to have those tucked away in the sound hole, and then the app could give you yeah. those pro features. Right, right. Pro features, right? I, I have a little pet peeve, and my wife, she's a, a fan of shopping, and she'll say, and she read a book about this. She said, what's happened today is that there are so many choices, sometimes the customer says none of the above. So when we first came out with whatever system it was, and it had, what, eight, nine microphones, and I said to someone from Fishman, I said, really? Why? And they said, because we could. <laughs> it's like, just because you could doesn't mean you should. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. It's nice, it's nice to have just the right amount of things, but that's why apps are good, because you can lock it all away in the app and then get, yeah, get to right. it if you need it. So, you've right. always, you've always, that's, so I guess you look at some other manufacturers, they manufacture their own pickup. Some, some companies manufacture a guitar around a pickup. But I guess you've had the relationship with Fishman where you've just worked with them. And that's been almost, you're, you're almost like one company, I always think, in some ways. You're like brothers, right? Yeah, well, but we also say to Larry, Larry, we're going to, we're going to date other people. Mm. And, you know, we're going to have conversations <laughs> with Lloyd Bags and my side and all those folks. Because we don't, we don't want to stick our heads in the sand and ignore someone else's compelling technology. Yeah, we had Lloyd Bags on last week. He was a very, oh, cool. he was great. Yep. And um, so, yep. so, do you mind me asking what the what what, what was the um, was that again? Customers just re requesting that. Yes, and even dealers. It's funny, you know. Sometimes you'll get a dealer or a foreign distributor that falls in love with a different system, and so now then it gets really challenging. It's like, okay, we introduced this new model, and the dealer will say, "I love the new model. Can I get it without the pickup?" And we're like, "No." That's part of the guitar. And they're like, well, I don't like Fishman pickups. For whatever reason, I like something else. And so I want to buy the guitar and put that pickup in the guitar before I distribute it. So that can get a little frustrating. So, and we've, we've gone back and forth. We've, we've, in the past, we've offered too many different brands, but Fishman's always been our go-to. But we, we do talk to other folks, you know, because, you know, there's no, Larry doesn't have all the good ideas. I think I think I'll invite Larry on my show next. I think, yeah, you should. I think it'd yeah, be really great. It'd yeah. be really great. All right. I, I I always focus on that because that's one of my passions is how to amplify an acoustic guitar, and I talk about it a lot on my channel. I don't want to I don't want to only talk about that though while I've got you here. Um, but I know a lot of people don't ask you about that, so I like to I like to talk about that stuff. But let's talk about the uh, Dick Boat mentioned the the museum. He said you guys kind of created it together. Um, yep. So can you tell us about that and, and also the tours, because the tours and the backstage tour are so amazing. I must have done them 
eight times or something. They're great. So when did they start and, and why did you start doing those? So the, the tours have been being, they, we've given tours forever um, informally. I know even, if, even when we were over at North Street, my grandfather said, if a, if a customer stopped by and knocked on the door and said, can I see where my Martin guitar was made? He'd say, sure, and he'd show them around. And then when we moved out to Sycamore Street, it became more formal. We had initially what we call the museum. It was a circular room with some plexiglass cases and some really good direct lighting. And we would put some of our limited collection in there, but we never told the story. And then years ago, I got asked to join the NAM Museum Board. NAM decided when they moved to Carlsbad that they were going to put a museum in their new office building. And they asked me to join the board. And we contracted with a company, a virtual company out of Boston that does museums. And they get people together and they say, okay, this is the project. And it turns out that one of the principals, Sherry West, came from a musical family, West Music, out in Iowa. And that really helped because she knew the language. You know, it, it's not, you know, you start talking guitar parts to people that don't understand guitars, and pretty soon they're like, what are they? Frets, intonation, headstock, tailpiece, uh, you know. But Sherry knew all that. And so when they did the NAM Museum, it was you would walk through the history of music retailing in like 20-year increments. And so when we decided to commit to the museum we have today, I said, let's call this group. So they came in and I said, we can do the same thing because we have the same kind of history. We'll start in the beginning and then every 20 years or so, we'll move to a different display. And my colleagues, God bless them, they said, that's great, Chris, but we need a second, we need a second bid. I'm like, okay, I know these folks, but that's fine. So we brought in another group and they were like, oh, we did the Coca-Cola Museum. And if you've been, if you come to our museum, you'll notice back in a in the back is a little room and that's chris's room and that's my guitars and stuff just stuff i'm collecting when i am around the world travel and so this other group is in and we've already kind of laid out the space and they're looking at it they're going okay you know we can certainly help you with this project what's this little room in the corner and someone says oh that's chris's room and they go well what's the purpose of that and they said, well, that's for Chris to put his guitars and his, you know, artifacts that he, and they said, well, you know, that's wasted space. And I was in the room. <laughs> and I looked at them and I'm like, you know, I signed the checks. And they go, so let's just say they didn't get the gig. <laughs> so that's oh, the, the way the museum's laid out. Then, then, you know, we give the formal tours. And then someone said years ago, they said, when people come to visit, and they're really keenly interested in behind the scenes. But we can't take you if you show up, for example, in flip-flops. We can take you on a regular tour. So we need you to, to um, re reserve a space on the behind the scene tour where we say, hey, you don't need steel tip shoes, but you do need closed toed shoes. So we, we kind of we prep you before you show up. So that's like, yes, we can take you down in the machine room because you're where, and then we're going to put on safety glasses and we're going to put ear protection in. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's amazing. I've done the, for anyone watching, I've done the, the I call it the, the, what should I call it, the free or the regular tour. I don't want to put it down. It's an awesome tour, the standard tour. But yeah. then the enhanced tour, the backstage tour is really something else. That's just absolutely incredible. I love that one. When you, when, you go, when you go sort of even further back and see the woods and everything. And the tour guides are also awesome and, and this, it's yep. amazing. Anyone visiting should, well, obviously when, when it's open, should go. Actually, we get yeah. to that. Can we just touch on that? It must be, first of all, we hope everyone's okay at the factory and it must be very um, tough right now. How, how, has this, in, we're talking about the history of the company. So has, this, has something like this ever happened before where you've actually closed down completely? So we, we chatted before we came on the air. I wrote a little piece for Music Trades, and it's actually on our website, where I went back as best I could. And I looked at, you know, what kind of things would affect the business beyond music. And it turns out it's often economic and or political. I don't know if we've ever been forced to close. I do know from discussions I had with my grandfather, reading things in the history book and just, you know, knowing how tough things have been that we probably got close to closing, but it was because of business conditions 
related to do people want to play the guitar? Do they can they afford a guitar? Back like say during the Great Depression. Mm. So th that's those times were more of okay, we're hanging on for dear life, but but we're going to come to work and try and make it work. Right now we can't go to work. That's really frustrating. My colleagues want to come back. They want to build guitars. Um, so that I don't think we've ever been mandated to be closed, and it's a challenge because we're we're close enough to New York that we're part of that. You know, that re it's a hot zone, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and this eastern part of Pennsylvania and down into Philly. We have to be careful. Yeah, of course. And you have to, you have to be safe, of course. I, I, see, right. I, I do see a lot of people learning the guitar now because some yeah. people have time to pursue their yeah. passion. Yep. Um, so that's good. But how will this that's affect good. the production and shipping and all those kind of things? Will you have a backlog? That, will there be a shortage of guitars, do you think? Yeah, I mean, business was good before this happened. And so we were anticipating it remaining good for the rest of the year. Uh, we have guitars in work. Then we were told to close. So we closed. Then we asked for an exemption. Could we send 25 people into the warehouse? And they said no. And then it's like, boy, you know, let's ask again. They said, let's, let's not be as ambitious. Could we get six people into the warehouse? And the, and the governor's office said, fine. So that's allowed us to go in and receive things that were on the water, for example, tuning machines coming from Asia, and ship what was finished. Now we need to get back into the plant because we pretty much shipped all the stuff that's finished. Now we got to finish the stuff that's not quite finished so they can be shipped. That's not going to happen until we reopen. Mm -hmm. We're working on a plan. You know, we, we're, we're ready. We've got a plan. We've got masks. We're going to do social distancing. We're going to take everyone's temperature when they come to work. We just need the governor to give us the go at it. Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. Um, so there's been a lot of talk on all these um, chats about the SC13 guitar, which is quite yep. a modern, that's very modern design. Yep. So again, I see you. I see the company moving in a more modern direction. Is this was this your idea or or other people at the factory's idea? I'm actually going to say, if you talk to people, they're going to say Chris was skeptical in the beginning. Mm, interesting. This was it was definitely not my idea. And when I'm skeptical, I let people know. I, it's like, okay, talk to me about what you what you want to do with this. What what do you think the purpose of it is? What's why is it going to be compelling? And the more they talk to me, the more I'm like, okay. All right, I hear you. I get it. Makes sense. You know, there are things that we that would be very difficult to do on a traditional Martin guitar that this design allowed us to do without people going, oh, my God, they've lost their minds. Mm. It was really hard. Just that that whole configuring the neck and the body and the joint and making it adjustable. That took a long time. The only thing I will say, God bless my colleagues. This was, I don't know, nine months ago. They came to me. They said, Chris. It's going to be another year and a half. And I said, oh, please, no. Please, no, I don't have the patience. So I did push them. I said, look, we got an AMP show coming up. You got, to, you got to focus on this. Stop some of the other things you're working on. And so that, so, so for better or worse, I think I took six months out of the project, which they would have preferred to have had. But I'm glad we, because now, now the summer NAM show is canceled, because that was the fallback, is we'll take it to the summer NAM show in Nashville. Well, thank goodness we took it to Anaheim. Mm. How is the, oh, I, 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 I kind of, when I saw it at NAM, I thought, well, Martin again is very traditional. A lot of people like that. You do something new and people kind of freak out sometimes. At the yeah. same time, there's a new generation that do like low action and electric guitar right. style, you know, thinner bodies. So, yeah. why, I mean, my, my personal thought is why not do both? If you make the standard series, which I absolutely love, and make yeah. this as well, you can have right. one or the other or both, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, no one's forcing you. It's your choice. Yeah. 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 So do you and, think and it's, it's worth mentioning mm. in that first display case in the museum is a C.F. Martin senior Stauffer style guitar made in the 1830s with an adjustable neck. Oh, really? You kind of come full circle now. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. Yep. So that's a that's a thirteen series. Are we gonna? I, I, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to answer my questions, but I have to ask them. Are we gonna see a twenty eight series, a thirty five series of that guitar? I think right now the tooling is in Navajo, and again we're we're, we're going to be busy when the factory reopens. We're not going to have the ability right now to reproduce the tooling for Nazareth. So my 
feeling for the time being is whatever we can do to it in Navajoa, we'll do. But to, to, to duplicate that tooling, is that's hard work. Right, right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on with that guitar, right? There's a lot of, a lot of innovation and technology in that yep. guitar. Um, I was actually, I was speaking with, um, I'm friends with Skip, and I, I said maybe we can do a show just about that guitar sometime, because oh, oh, there's, yeah, yep. there's so much to talk about with that guitar. Um, okay, so we lo- on this show, we love the stories. We love the stories that people have, and I'm sure you've got a few of them. I hope you do. <laughs> about, do, you have about. Any, do you have any good stories about um, famous people, people we might know that you've met over the years? Uh, so, yes. Um, some, some, some of the stories that, that I tell, you would say, well, that's what I would have assumed from that person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so without getting into a lot of the gory details, sometimes artists' reputations do precede them. And what, one, thing, one thing I found is, particularly when you're that famous, it's often a question of if you catch them in the right mood, it's great. But if you catch them in the wrong mood, it's not great. And, and you know, when you're that kind of an artist, I think you can get temperamental. Mm. And I think sometimes it's, it's, it's allowed, it's, 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 you're surrounded by people, it's like, oh, that's okay. That's okay. You're, you're just being an artist, you know. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you gory detail stories, <laughs> but I, I will tell. The, the, one of the most charming ones was we were, we were doing the Paul Simon guitar, and Dick says, let's go into Manhattan. Paul was working on a play. The play didn't do, out, do very well. I saw it in the previews, and it closed like a week later. So we get to this, like, black box theater, and we're there, and, and someone says, Paul will be down in a minute. He's not feeling well. And Dick said, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you, he has the flu. And he was really sick. And he comes in, and all he was concerned about was, how did I feel? Chris, are you okay? Can I get you anything? Like, Paul, you're the one who's sick. Oh, don't worry about me. I want to make sure you're okay. Now, you came all the way to New York. Are you sure? And that was really charming, Mm. that despite the fact that he had the flu, he was concerned about, you know, how was I feeling? So that was the real One of the real challenges with Nazareth is, we're just far enough away and out of the way enough that getting artists to the factory is tricky, tricky, tricky. For example, my daughter's a big Post Malone fan, mm. and it turns out, uh, before the tour had this end, he was coming our way, playing in Philly, playing in Hershey. He's going to stop at the factory Friday. So I said, Claire, when I get the word that he's on the way, I'll come pick you up from school and you can meet him at the factory. We did get to see him in Hershey, and that was fun, and we got to meet him backstage. And sure enough, the, the plans changed, and he never made it to the factory. So that's oftentimes that happens. As they're touring, something happens, and they're like, are you open Saturday? No. Are you open at night? No. Oh, because we're driving through the Lehigh Valley at 2 in the morning. Well, I'm sorry, we're not open. <laughs> so so you, you've never opened the factory for someone you know, after hours? <laughs> I, I'm very adamant in the fact that when you come to visit, I want you to see guitars being made. Mm. I don't want you to see an empty factory. That's no fun. Right. That, that, that's not what it is all about at all. Right. I asked Dick, actually, um, is there a back door? Like, does, does John Mayer come through the back door, not the front door? All right. So we, we did, and Dick learned this. We do now have to say to our colleagues, a famous person is coming, and they will do autographs, or a famous person is coming, and they would prefer not to do autographs because what will happen is they'll get out on the shop floor. And as they're walking along, people will stop what they're working and just pull out a piece of paper and go, can I have your autograph? Oh, wow. <laughs> so we kind of prep everybody go, they're coming through. They're really not in the mood to sign 300 autographs today. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but Dick told the story. I think it was Paul Simon, but he announced Paul Simon's coming. He, he doesn't want to sign autographs. Don't don't acknowledge him. And then Paul turns to Dick and says, why is no one recognizing me yet? <laughs> That's the other side. Don't they know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> I love that story. It's great. No, it must be great, though, to go there one day and see um, Eric Clapton or John Mayer. Or, you know, and you know who Sheeran. comes through more often than not is the rest of the band oh. and techs. Like, you know, we have, big, we have music fest here. Because often, you know, oftentimes the artists, they're, you know, it's like particularly if they're performing, they want to maybe stay in their suite just kind of get there, but they, the, the rest of the band's like, yeah, let's go, let's go visit Martin. So that's, that often happens that the, the, the star doesn't quite make it, but everybody else in the entourage shows up and spends the afternoon. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can imagine. That. Any musician wants to go there, and even if you're not a musician, it's right. all of the history is again. The history is the amazing thing, isn't it? Amazing history. Wow. Okay, so um, I want to go to the viewers and see if we've got some questions. I've seen some good ones come up. We've got fifty people. We've got fifty people watching. So thank you so much for joining us. It's awesome. And uh, let's ask Chris some questions while we're here. If you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat. I've seen some. I just have to go through them. Here we go. Edward says, thanks for doing this. Yeah, well, it's absolutely fine. Again, thanks to Chris for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, no, I've got so many comments here. I've got, sorry, I should, have, I should have marked them off as I went. Um, someone said maybe Martin could build a guitar with built-in effects like the tone with amp. But I think you said earlier that your focus is to make the... It's transparent, right? The guitar, but yeah, we we get and, and I love them. I, I'm going to call them wacky inventors. Mm -hmm. All right, and they come to visit. It's gotten more complicated now. We have to say, you know, do you have a patent? No. Okay. Is are your patent applied for? No. We probably can't even look at your thing, your invention, because we don't want you to come back and sue us someday. You've heard those stories, mm -hmm. but people they they are looking for ways to to enhance the sound of guitars. And once in a while, that crazy thing they come up with really does work. But oftentimes, it's close but no cigar. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a really like overly engineered device that people want to attach to an acoustic guitar that's like the customer is just not going to want to do this. Right. Or yeah. some will, but not as many as you think. And, and I love... You know, they'll always do research. They go like, well, we know how big the guitar market is. Oh, do you really? Yeah, it's this many million units a year. Oh, really? Okay. Well, we only want 10% of the market the first year. Oh, so how many is that? Well, let's call it 200,000. They're like, no, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen with your new idea that the first year, 200,000 people are going to buy it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's, that's interesting because when I was at NAMM, um, you walk around NAMM and all you see is electric guitar amplification in general, like 70% uh, pedals, uh, amps, uh, uh, modelers, amps, all these different things. And I said to another company there about, oh, are you going to make more pedals for acoustic guitarists and the kind of loopers? And, that's, and he said to me, well, the acoustic guitar market is very small. So what do you think about that? I, I think the market for devices to put in between your acoustic guitar and the PA system is certainly much smaller than it is for electric guitars, but I think it's also underserved. Mm. I think that if some of these pedal guys came up with a compelling product that differentiated it from an electric guitar pedal, I'll bet some acoustic electric guitar players... Well, Craig, what's that thing Craig bought? Craig bought something recently. He bought a Kemper. Yeah. It's, it's, still, it's still in the box, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> i got to give him a lesson on Skype. Um, yeah, but yeah, but but I think I think again we're talking about the new generation that you know yep. kids that I don't say kids, but you know, kids that are used to phones and apps and pedals and effects yep. and those kind of like Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran must have made a huge impact on that amplification scene with the looping. Yeah, that kind right, of thing. So two funny stories, both um, European. I'm in London and we're doing a dealer thing. So I give my talk, and we're having dinner with the dealers. And one dealer comes over. He goes, "I tell you a funny story. We're in the shop. We're hanging out. This floppy-haired kid comes in, and he goes, "Yeah, I'm do some busking. I need a really durable little guitar." And they sell him an LX. And he goes, ah, "I think I want to buy one of those looper things." And they're like, "All right." So they sell him a looper. And he's on the way out, and they, the guys behind the counter go, "That kid's going nowhere." Really? It was Ed. It was Ed. Wow, that's a, that's a story <laughs> that right there. Dick Boke and I, let's go back, oh my gosh, back into the 70s, I guess. We were sent over to the Levin Guitar Factory to see if there were any wood parts that we could bring to Nazareth because the Levin Factory was going down. It, it, was, it was not going to survive. So we did what we could. And then for some reason, to get home, we went to, to Copenhagen from Jetteborg. I guess it was easier to get home from Copenhagen. And we had an evening to kill, so we went to a little club, and we saw a guy named John Martin, who played a D28 through an, an, an array of effects. Have you ever seen or heard John Martin? I haven't. I want to check him out now. You got to check it. There's some videos of him. They're old, grainy videos. Mm. I mean, the stuff he did with a D28 with a pedal board 
is, is it's, it's like, so anytime someone says there's not a market for pedals, for acoustic guitars, with pickups, tell them to look again. Oh, no, I think there is. But I, I was so interested to ask you, because again, I wasn't sure if your position was tradition or that's, I wasn't sure how important that side was to you as a company. It's just, it's not what we do. Hmm. It's not what I want to do, but I would like to encourage the pedal people. It's like, isn't the, elect, isn't the solid body pedal market already saturated? Aren't you guys looking for opportunity? And maybe even like ukuleles with pickups. There's got to be more than just another pedal to make your Stratocaster sound a little different than all the other pedals you already own. Mm. What do you, have you got any thoughts on um, bags that bring out the Stagescape, the IR pedal, and there's the Tone Dexter? You got any thoughts on those pedals? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, if you get a little too technical with me, and I'm just going to go, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> there's my answer then. <laughs> I'll pass on that one. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like the, um, the aura. You know, I mean, I'm glad that I'm glad that Fishman are developing the aura system more like the new one in the modern deluxe behind me. That sounds yeah. really, sounds really great. Yeah. And it's simple and it just sounds good. So I, I like the direction they're going with that. Um, oh, so I, you have to ask Larry when you have him on. Yeah. I'm going to butcher this story, but he tells a story about getting, particularly I think being in Boston, that he, he would have conversations with people that were working like for the government, doing research, like MIT, you know, it's things, people that spin off from MIT. And he said he was talking to a, someone that, that worked with um, measuring earthquakes. And they were talking about the technology. And Larry said, well, what do you use? He said, we use this film. We just lay it out in the desert. And then it picks up vibration. And Larry says, well, where do you get the film? And they go, oh, I'll give them so-and-so. And he goes, can you get me some of that film? He made a pickup out of it. Mm. He, instead of having six individual piezo crystals under each string, mm. he uses wow. this film that was developed by the government to do seismographic testing. Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah, I have, I have to get him on. I really do. Because you know, when it comes to pickups, he know, well, he's, yep. been, he's been around since the beginning, right? Yeah, so did, 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 I ask, did I ask you who made the very first ever acoustic pickup? Did we, we talk about that on air? Or I, did think, we talk I, about I, I, I think we spoke about it on air, but I've been, I've been trying to research yeah. two things. One is what was, the ve what was the very first acoustic guitar pickup, aside from a microphone, which isn't a pickup. Yeah. And two, yeah. and two, who was the first person to use acoustic IRs? I think it was Fishman with the Aura system, but I'm still researching okay. that. Okay. But uh, maybe that's a good question for Larry. Yeah. Yep. Um, Maury Rutch says, Mike Dickinson is the best tour guide. Change my mind. Well, surely, surely, surely um, C.F. Martin is the best tour guide, Maury. <laughs> and I, today I give a lot more museum tours than I do factory tours. Oh, you, so you do tours of the museum? Yep. That's, into, oh, that's cool. That'd be really great. Um, yeah, I think, I think Dick Vogt said he sometimes goes on the tours. And I said that must be really scary for the person giving the tour because <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> well, he's researched everything, right? He's, he's written the book, yep. so... Um, David said he visited in 1978. Wow. I had to drop off my 73 D35, which was having serious issues. The guitar got stuck for a while due to the strike. I imagine things look different today. Yeah, I'm sure the factory... Well, how has, has, how, how has the factory changed over the years? Like, it, does, it, does it look pretty much the same as it did? Or Well, you know, I, I have to give Bob Taylor credit that... It was, I was at a trade show and someone said, you need to go over to the Taylor booth and take a look at the video that they're showing. I said, why? He said, just go over. So it was a video of a CNC machine. And my dad had tried, he really did try to automate. And I know that's, that's a word that guitar builders and guitar players and guitar buyers freak out about. But, you know, sometimes in order to keep the cost down, automation helps. And what my dad found when he went looking for machines, most of the machines that are built to, to make wooden things are designed for what's called flat. It's a really good example. I just uh, had the experience um, a year or so ago to go down to Knoll. Knoll's a furniture company. Oh, you're, you're, they, you're breaking up a little. Sorry. Up. I went, went to visit the Knoll yeah. Furniture Factory. And they had, they had a complete, like it was a $8 million line just designed to do tabletops. So 
back in the day when my dad would go out and say, where can we get woodworking machinery that can cut in three dimensions, like for a guitar neck, for example, not just a, like a tabletop. It, you had to go to Europe, and the, the machines were crazy expensive, mm. crazy money for high volume. And we couldn't justify the cost because we couldn't justify the volume. So we went and bought more draw knives. And it was a really frustrating time because we just couldn't get beyond the draw knife. And then when Bob, who came, you know, had a Votech background, coming in Southern California where they were using CNC machines to cut metal, I think Bob was like, wait a minute. If this thing can cut metal, it can cut wood. Mm. And that really revolutionized the early stages of guitar manufacturing. Because you eliminate a lot of the teardown, the setup, the checking of specs every time you want to do a different cut on, for example, a bridge. The CNC machine, you program it, it does it soup to nuts. Yeah, someone, so, sorry. Someone said, how has the introduction of CNC changed how Martin makes the higher-end guitars? Our philosophy regarding mechanization has always been if it... If the quality deteriorates, we don't even want to talk about it. Mm. If it improves efficiency, we want to talk about it. If it improves efficiency and the quality stays the same, we want to talk about it. Mm. If it improves efficiency and the quality improves, where do I sign? Mm. Yeah, of so course. It, Common sense, right? We, we, we vet this stuff. It's like, look, if it's going to make them more efficiently, we've got to consider it. And sometimes it makes a better part. Yeah. You know, it's just the, my ancestors would kill for the technology we have today in Nazareth. They, they would have embraced it wholeheartedly if it had been available to them at that time. Of course, technology isn't always a bad thing, right? right. It can be better. So. Yep. Um, someone else mentioned to me the other day when I, when I promoted this about Street Ebony. I know Bob Taylor's been doing a lot with that. Are we going to see um, Street Ebony on Martin guitar fretboards? For, you know, in the yeah, you know, and a lot of us, we still stain. We hmm. still throw some stain on there. So... It's it, people. It's funny when when you get into high end guitars, the perceptions people have about wood quality. I think sometimes it's. I want to say, close your eyes, close your eyes, and listen to what the guitar sounds like. Oh, it sounds great, but I don't like the way that piece of wood looks. <laughs> Sound like, sounds wood. like me. Sounds like me. <laughs> it's wood. Wood's gonna look like wood. <laughs> yeah. Wanted plastic, go buy a plastic guitar. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to be told that. Like, there's a wood grain on it. Oh, it's wood. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, sometimes, you know, sometimes we get so precious about it. we're buying a D28. We want so, it to be so every, just right. I have the answer for everyone that wants the best wood. Yeah, it's the D45. Mm. That's the answer. You want the best wood? Get a D45. Well, how do you grade wood? Because I, I, I've got a story that I played a... I love the HD28. Amazing. That's my favorite all-round guitar to record and play with. I love that guitar. But I once I once tried a D... I won the reimagined D42s. And I thought it sounded incredible. And it had very straight grain. And I know the wood is graded um, you know, cosmetically. It looks, yeah. looks yeah. more... Someone like me would obviously want that because it looks more uniform. But yeah. does that... Do you, do you believe that affects the tone of the guitar? My grandfather always felt that not only did you get the straightest grain wood on the higher price guitars, the bonus was it's probably going to sound a little better also. Mm. That was his thought, that that's, that's the best wood. Now, the flip side of that is you get people that want wild grain Brazilian rosewood. Mm. They want that crazy wild look, which structurally is a little iffy, but cosmetically, I got to say, it's, it's pretty flamboyant. And sometimes that's what people want. You know, they, they, they want a guitar that looks as good as it sounds. Yeah, exactly. Some people, so some people, the look is very important. Right. Of course. And we've been speaking to Mike Dickinson. One of Mike's charges has been, Mike, when you go out in the field or you go to visit our vendors, if they have figured wood and it's in dreadnought sizes, buy it because that will sell on a custom guitar. Mm. Very interesting. Um, Edward Sparks is here. He says, hi, Chris. I have two miniature Martin guitars in the museum. One I sent to your oh, father in the oh, 80s. And the second, oh, my God. The second yeah. is in the, what, how do you say that? Stoffer case? Stoffer, yeah. Case? Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah, what a labor of love. We've got, a, we've got a couple of dozen of those little guitars, and it's like, oh, my God, how much time did you spend making that thing? <laughs> yes. 
Then he says, by the way, I have a 1976 D28 and a 1980 D28 12-string. Oh, great. Mm. Okay, here's a question for you. What's your, right. what's your favorite Martin guitar for the price and why? So if you look at, and they, you know, they, they really came into their own back during the Great Depression, the all mahogany guitars. They're, they're mahogany, so you know, we, we're, we know we're getting a good tropical wood there. And it's the quality of the construction is the same. The quality of the wood is good. It's not figured. It's you know plain straight grain mahogany. But what we did with the with this with the all mahogany guitars in the depression is we took off all of the ornamentation that really didn't have a purpose. And so in terms of value, it's a great value because it's built just like a D forty five. It just doesn't have pearl inlay. Hmm. Now my. Personally, my predilection when I get a Martin guitar is I, I like Pearl. I like fancy Martin guitars. I have the luxury of being able to go pick my own wood. So when I treat myself to a guitar, I end up, I, there's always an extra zero on the price. Do you, do you play the guitar? Ah, well. <laughs> really I, just, cool I just book, went there. <laughs> a really cool book called uh, My First Guitar that I I. I'm fortunate to be in along with some really famous guitar players. And the story I tell is that I wanted to play. My parents were divorced. I didn't even have a guitar. I'd gone to summer camp and the, one of the counselors had a D18. I'm like, you know, I should get a guitar. So it comes around Christmas and my dad and my grandfather are like, what do you want? I want a guitar. Okay. So they sent me a 518, good size for a 10 year old. It had nylon strings. Living in New Jersey, my mother's father, my other grandfather was a physician, and my mother worked with him in the doctor's office. And Mr. Conrad had a little music store in, the, in Lyndhurst, and he gave lessons. So mom, my mom said, I got you signed up to go take lessons with Mr. Conrad at his home on Tuesday. Okay. So I show up, little Chris, and my mom had changed my name. It was so awkward for her and me, because she had remarried to try and explain why my last name was Martin and my brother and sister and my mother and father's last name was Greff. So she, not legally, just changed my name to Greff. So Mr. Conrad knew Chris Greff is coming over to take the car license. I don't think he knew I was Chris Martin. Mm -hmm. So I show up and he's going, oh, you have a guitar. I think he was disappointed because he had a music guitar because he thought he was going to sell me a guitar. I said, yeah, I have a guitar. And I said, I really don't know what to do with it. He said, well, that's why you're here. Let's take a look at it. So. We open it up, and he looks at it, and he looks at me, and he looks at the guitar, and he goes, okay, it's a nylon string, so it's a classic guitar. It's a Martin guitar. I said, yeah, I know it's a Martin guitar. He goes, you don't know how to play the guitar. I said, I don't know how to play the guitar. He said, uh, I usually don't get beginners in my studio where their first guitar is a Martin guitar. Uh, I said, I, said, I, I, don't, you know, I, I don't know what to say. My dad owns the company. <laughs> so that's the point that I think the light bulb went off in Mr. Conrad's head. And he said, I am going to create the next Segovia. I'm thinking Beatles. I'm thinking steel string. And there he is. He pulls out the footstool, puts my foot on the footstool. says, so you got to sit up straight. Put your thumb on the back of the neck just like this. And I'm sitting there in this character of myself going, I've never seen any of the Beatles do this. So the, the entire story is in that book, my first guitar. And I'm going to leave it up to your imagination as to how good a guitar player I really am. Mm. Well, you just need three chords and the truth, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go rapid fire through these last questions. Uh, Maury's Music, do you have plans to expand on the Modern Deluxe series? We've done really well with them so far. Um, yes, I would say right now expansion is on hold mm. until we get back to work and finish all the guitars that are in work and process. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. What's, what's your thoughts on cutaway guitars? Okay, so I went, um, it was in Barcelona. It's in Barcelona, and they had a little guitar museum. And Dick Boak did this years ago, and he, he thought he was the first. It was an m size double cutaway Martin. And I, I, I came back from that trip to Barcelona, and I said, Dick, I got some bad news for you. He said, what? I said, I was in a museum in Spain. And they had a guitar in the museum from the late 1800s, and it was a, an acoustic guitar, and it was a double cutaway. Mm. So I think that, the, like, like with the new, the new guitar, the S model, 
there, there's a reason you want to cut away, but if it gets in the way of what you're trying to do, you can't do what you're trying to do. So they, they have a purpose, but I think a lot of people have had, had to kind of accommodate their style to work through that awkwardness of a big acoustic guitar with a cutaway. And so that's, that was the part of the impetus of the S model was, wouldn't it be cool if you didn't have to contort your hand to get around the heel and that square off parse when you go down to play up the fretboard? Right. So if you're going to have a cutaway, then have a real cutaway for that purpose. I've got to say, though, I have an H, one of those HDC reimagined. Okay. With the, yeah. I love that guitar. I think, are they discontinued now? I think they might be, but I love that guitar. Yeah. Okay. That's the best thing we found is people generally want a regular old acoustic non-cutaway Martin yeah. or they want an acoustic electric. And when we try and say, well, we can make your D28 an acoustic electric, they're like, nah, that's yeah. I want that to be my acoustic guitar. Right. One or the other. That's what I've been telling yeah. people about pickups. Get yourself a great recording guitar with no pickup and get yourself a stage guitar. There you go. Yeah. That's, then you have, then there's no compromise. But there right. are people, like I spent many years, that's why I started this channel and started coming to NAMM, I spent many years trying to get an HD28 that also amplified like a Maiden or a, something like that, you know. So, let me just turn my camera's overheating here. Okay, I just want to get through these last questions. Are we okay for time, Chris? We've got, yeah, we sure. got, we got five minutes. We've got, we got 53 people watching us. Really awesome. Let's so turn this camera off, my camera off. I'll just put you on the screen. Right. Okay, so, um, okay, so what's the next what's the next guitar to get the authentic treatment? Well, we're getting down to some pretty obscure and, and esoteric stuff. Sometimes it's something that we come across, maybe at an auction or a guitar show, or a vintage dealer will call us and say, "Hey, this is pretty intriguing. You guys want to think about doing, you know, a reproduction of it?" We've we've picked some of the right fruit. So it's, it's some of it's kind of a mirror. And you take a flyer, mm. you tool up, you hope you sell, you know, 50 or 100. And if you do, okay, it was fun. Um, David said he appreciates the consistency of instruments made by CNC. So there you go. Yep. Yep. Okay. Amanda says. Well, and let's clarify the instrument isn't made by the CNC, the right. parts are made by the CNC. The instrument is made by the guitar builders. Right. The parts are, yep, yeah, I agree. Um, Oh, we've got someone from Mexico. Cool. I saved up for a whole year to afford my D28. It's been my closest friend ever wow. since and travels with me everywhere. Great. To get it was a big deal for me from Mexico. Very nice. Cool. Um, let me just go through here. Okay, I had, I, had, I had a bit of an Easter egg. Oh, my camera's off now, but I have one of, one of the elephant toys here. We had a question as well. Uh, can you tell us about the Save the Elephants campaign, how it started and how it's, how it's been going? It started, my dad started talking to people about ivory back in the late 1960s. And we actually had a little hang tag that we put on the guitars from that point that said to our customers, we have chosen not to continue to use ivory because of the slaughtering of the elephants. And so the Save the Elephant campaign kind of came full circle when I said to my colleagues, isn't this ironic that here now, some 50 years later, we still, still haven't resolved this dilemma. Mm. And what's, so what's the current um, situation with that? Um, you know, I want to believe that more and more of us human beings are going to be inclined to take a closer look at this precious earth of ours and maybe not be so cavalier about just assuming that everything is unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, especially you know, now. Yeah. Of course. Now's, now's kind of the time to kind of say, wait, do we need to rethink our purpose, our purpose on earth? Is our purpose to just, okay, so years ago, I went down to, to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia and they had a big map of the US and they talked about Westerners coming to the East Coast. And they're on this, you know, looking for prosperity and, and raw materials. And they basically said that the European settlers marched their way with their Conestoga wagons across the U.S. and harvested what they could along the way. And then when they got to the Pacific Ocean, 
they turned around and went back to get all the stuff they forgot the first time. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jason Carter, does pearl inlay affect the tone or is it purely decorative? I asked this to Dick Boke as well. What's your opinion on that? On that? Boy, that's, you know, I think anyone who pays a lot of money for a pearl guitar wants to believe it sounds better. <laughs> <Great answer. laughs> so, I know, that's a good one. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I guess some, I someone, say, someone said to yeah. me, everything, everything affects the tone of the guitar. Everything. Yeah, too, too much. For example, that when you talk to guitar historians, they will talk about, they were, they were called the French court guitars. And these things, you've seen them. They're in the Met. You've seen pictures of them in the, in the, in the guitar history books. Mm -hmm. They were just so full of inlay and ivory and tortoiseshell that after the fact, guitar historians who have encountered those instruments in museums say they look incredible and sound terrible. <laughs> well, you, you, have a, you have a guitar in the museum, right, with the, all the inlay and everything? Yeah. Does it ever get played, or is that, like, cosmetic? Um. Well, we, we let people play the stuff in the museum. Mm. We do. That's, yeah. good to, that's good to know. I'll remember that for the future. <laughs> I'll say, Chris, Chris said I could play the prototype of the John Mayer guitar. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, just one more, I think. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry, two more. Can we okay. expect another CEO model soon? No, but you can expect it's my birthday. Mm. And we have in the past celebrated my birthday, a significant birthday. So I'll be 65 this summer. So you might want to keep your keep your eye out for a Chris Martin 65th birthday guitar. Very cool. And happy birthday for then. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um, do you anticipate that guitars will still be made from exotic woods? For example, mm -hmm. rosewood, mahogany, and ebony decades from now. Are we, are we going to see a change in the, in the woods we're using now? I do. I also anticipate that some of those rare exotic woods will be so rare and exotic that the guitars will be very expensive. And that may be what needs to happen for people to be willing to consider alternative materials because, mm. because labor is such an, an, an integral part of the cost of a guitar that the raw material costs unless it's the difference between a thousand dollar set of wood and a ten thousand dollar set it doesn't make that much difference but i think some of these these very rare rosewoods ebony's they're going to be available in in smaller quantities and the prices are going to be staggering yeah so we should all go out and buy the guitars now right <laughs> <laughs> so we did it we did a focus group study uh, a couple of years ago and it was it was about cosmetics hmm. And we, we actually, we went back into our archive and we were showing, you know, a group of customers. We said, okay, this is where we are today. And we're getting pushback from people who said, I don't like the way that looks. We said, we want to show you some guitars we built from the 30s and 40s that had a lot of character. The customers were like, wow, I never really thought about that. But you're right. But, but they're really valuable. It's like, yeah, but isn't it interesting? The wood has a lot of character and they're still really valuable vintage guitars. So then we get all done. And we think that everyone's sympathetic and they're like, yeah, we understand. We're going to be more accepting of cosmetic character. We stop the, you know, the, the focus group and we're in the room where there's like the one-way mirror. And we're just kind of cleaning up. And this one guy leans over to another guy and he goes, we better go, go buy all the good ones right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that everyone's going to be ordering their, their Rosewood guitars right now. I mean, yeah, I think in, in the guitar world, it's funny, isn't it? Because we need to innovate, but people don't like change. People still want the old guitars and the old woods yeah. and the old amps, and yet yeah. we, we want to innovate and do the next thing. It's very hard yeah. sometimes to move forward. Yeah, and you know who got very frustrated with that was Henry Jeskowitz. When Henry took over Gibson, he and Dave, they did a good job. Gibson was a mess. They fixed it up, and then he tried to innovate, and people didn't. They just were like, no, Henry, we really don't want robotic tuners on our Les Paul. Yeah, that was a that the robot tuner thing was a big daring move, wasn't it? Yeah, and and you know, and unfortunately, Henry was inclined to go. It's it's I'm 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 all in or it's nothing. I think had he said we have one model, that model would have found some popularity. But putting it on everything all at once, the only advantage was that one of the gentlemen that was working with Henry in manufacturing said, Henry, I can't help you with this. And he quit and we hired him. So it all worked out. Mm. 
<laughs> well, that's absolutely. I mean, I, I got to tell you, Chris, I've, I've enjoyed this even more than I thought I would. I've been able to ask you the questions that have been on my mind over the years. We've had questions from people watching. We've had right now, we've got over 50 people watching. Thank you, everyone that tuned in. I really appreciate it. This will stay up so you can share this with your friends later on and they can rewatch it on my channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And I just can't thank you enough, Chris. We're really, really, uh, really my pleasure. It. It's been amazing. All right, get Larry, get Larry on. You'll have fun. Yes, I'm going to email him right now. All right, so, good. Take thank care. You. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow, that was absolutely awesome. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I really appreciate it. Over 50 people watching. Absolutely, I had the time in my life. As you probably know, I'm a huge Martin Guitar fan. The history is incredible. And to have C.F. Martin IV on here himself talking about the history is absolutely incredible. So I'm going to get some more guests. We, Wednesday, I have Maiden Guitars coming. I'm going to invite Larry Fishman. I'll invite lots more. So please do subscribe if you haven't. Share this with your friends. I'd love people to see this video because there was we didn't highlight some of the history, which you should check out yourself. But we, we talked about some things that haven't been discussed like the pickups and electronics. And I don't think I've heard those stories before. So I'm glad we got those. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Maury's music. I can't say thanks everyone. There's been so many great comments, but thank you all. I really, really appreciate it. And that was huge for me. I'm so happy. I'm gonna be very happy the rest of the day. So I'll see you again soon. Live streams most days, new videos all the time. Subscribe and ring the bell and you'll see when I go live and when I upload a new video. And until next time, be well, my friends. Thank you. Bye-bye.